Rob Seeley graduated from North Carolina State University with a Bachelor of Forestry degree in Natural Science and Forestry. Beginning his career as a seasonal in the Southern Appalachians, he moved into timber management in the late 1970s on the Flathead National Forest. His background in silviculture, Seeley says, was a natural conduit into predicting prescribed fire behavior and the ecological effects of fire causes. As you view Rob Seeley in the following video clip, notice how he has an almost uncanny ability to view a fire from both a broad and a narrow perspective. How does Seeley keep one perspective from dominating another perspective? How does he choose one fire prediction model over another? How does he merge all of his perspectives into the final fire behavior forecast? Well, you know, the Probably the watershed fire in my career was the Big Fish Fire in Colorado, 2002. Uh, it was a big fire use event. Um, and we ended up working on that. Well, I made two trips to Colorado, and I was there probably six to seven weeks total time on that fire. And uh, that was very interesting from the standpoint of uh, dealing with the, the local unit on it. It was their first big fire use fire. Um, it was certainly the premier Colorado wildfire season, and they were willing to let this fire, you know, be a fire use event. We went through a rainy period, uh, mm -hmm. all late July, early August, and I was actually the FUMA trainee at that point. And, and when I left, you know, I think the feeling was that uh, this fire was dead. And they had two inches of rain over 10 days. And I think people kind of lost track. The lesson there I learned was, you know, do not turn your back on a fire. You know, no matter how much it rains, because it didn't take but less than a week of hot, dry weather again, and this thing was up and running in the subalpine fur, and you know, all the modeling runs showed a pretty intensive fire. Um, that area has some um, spruce beetle kill uh, from the 1950s, and all this uh, spruce and, and uh, subalpine fur dead was on the ground, and so it was almost six feet tall, and it just wasn't pockets. It was continuous over thousands and thousands of acres of this deep, heavy fuels. And mm -hmm. then the subalpine fir was coming up through it. So there was no, no actions mm -hmm. to take to uh, mitigate things. It, when it started burning, there was, it was like an atom bomb going off. You just had to stand out of the way and hope for the best. So going back to how you're sizing up the big fish fire, and, and I, please don't let me put words in your mouth, but what I sense so far, you, 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 you want to look what's driving the fire. You're first getting there. You, you're talking to people generally first. You're getting, a, to use your word again, a mental picture of what's going on. Uh, what, what, what are you doing next? or how, how, What else are you using to get that mental picture? Well, you start collecting data, you know, like I said, the weather data. What was the weather up to this point? If you've had significant fire activity, what has the weather been where that's occurred? Um, you know, and talk to people about fuels. Do you have any maps of the fuels? You know, just learn the juxtaposition of the rocks and the, you know, any fuels map is is better than, you know, your, your eyeball, you know, a couple flights, you know, because it takes two or three flights for me to really get in tune with what I'm seeing on the ground. Mm -hmm. You know, it varies. Sometimes it takes a week mm -hmm. <laughs> to track down all these mm -hmm. people and all the information, and sometimes it just comes together in, you know, in an afternoon. It's just very variable. Mm -hmm. Depends on the physical situation, you know, who's available. Um, and sometimes you only have an hour. I mean, there's been questions I've been asked by the IC that you had an hour to compose a, an answer, you mm -hmm. know, and, and so you take a little different tact, okay. you know. You don't do a lot of modeling. Typically, I look for a lot of RAWs um, information, the history, the RAWs history, um, both that year, say the current year, so I can look at the trend, you know, where we are from an ERC standpoint, um, say this season compared to other seasons, compared to other significant fire seasons, and then looking at more detailed, you know, where are we at, say, on day significant fire activity occurred, what was the wind? you know, at the weather station, what was the humidity? Um, Usually when you get to a fire, you're there for a reason. It's significant, you know, mm -hmm. when I come from out of an area, um, it's a big deal. Look at that data? I try not to key in on too much. I try and keep, look at everything very broadly, and quite often things will pop out. 
you know, a wind direction or a wind speed, maybe, you know, very low humidities. Something like that will pop out as being, uh, you know, that was very unusual on that day, the day mm -hmm. of the big fire. No, no speed or something like you that. You want to keep your focus broad at first, you know, before you, you don't want to throw away any information or uh -huh. look past it. You know, try not to do every, you know, get real detailed right off the bat until you really understand what, what the fire is doing mm -hmm. and why it's doing what it's doing. And, and, and if you get too, too detailed too quick, what, what can happen to you? You can lose your perspective of the fire. You know, you start to look at uh, very minute details of, of, you know, say a two or three percent change in the RH caused this to happen. You focus on that when tomorrow it might be a wind thing. Look for the big, big items. You know, what's, they're, they're usually there, if you look. I very seldom have they not found, you know, something that's really different about this fire. Mm -hmm. Weather, fuels, topography. Mm -hmm. You know, what caused the fire to become a, an issue? The, the, the modeling you use, do you, have a, do you have a technique for, do you just use what's available, or do, would you prefer one over another, or? No, I've used, I use lots of different things depending on the, the need at the moment. You know, what data do you have? Do you have the data to use a certain tool? That's the first step. And if you don't have the data, don't even think about using that tool. But then quite often, you, know, you have a choice between several several tools and they, they seem to conflict at times but they really don't. They each have a specific purpose. Um, you know, and some look at um, like for example Farsight, if you're using Farsight, it looks at one fire over a long period of time with uh, day and night temperatures and humidities and things like that. But if you're really just interested in, in a, uh, a short term forecast, you know, Behave Plus or something would work very well. Including field experience in the model, does it provide another opinion? Or have you just married one to the other? And I guess I would say I tend to trust the models better and I would trust somebody's judgment out there who has not seen the full spectrum of fire behavior. Hmm. Uh, going back to the big fish fire, you know, one of the biggest mistakes I made early on in the modeling there was I toned the model down. Um, because people said we've never had a fire like that in this area. Well, that was a mistake. The model predicted yeah, the model a bigger fire. Was bigger fire. And, uh, and, and because nobody had ever experienced those conditions before. It was outside the, the realm of what people had experienced, weather-wise and fuel-wise, in that neck of the woods. You had people with 20 years experience there who had no idea that that fire was gonna do that. And so that was a good lesson to me that always, like the model can validate, you know, what your experience tells you and vice versa. Because there's more experience in these models than any of us have in our own mind. Even dozens of us together. There's more information in the model. You know, we, we typically think 20 or 30 years worth of weather is good, but we don't have 500 years worth of weather data, you know, mm -hmm. which, which just starts to begin to cover the variability. You know, we have cycles that go on for thousands of years, and, and we don't have any idea what those are. Mm -hmm. So when you go to a, a fire, you know, like in 2003, I think, the West Yellowstone Raw, not West Yellowstone, West Glacier Raw Station, the ERC was 145th percentile. And that had 45 years worth of data in it. And it was still, that season was at the 145th percentile. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we're gonna see those seasons where it's way outside what we've experienced and that's when we really need to wake up you know the biggest problem for me is when, when somebody asks when will it spot across a drainage or a big rocky area you really have no idea you know it's almost a random event you know one squirrely fire whirl or a you know wind shift for 10 minutes in the right direction you mm -hmm. know can make the, the difference in a fire moving into a drainage or not and so those are the things you really have to, to look for and say, you know, where does the model not fit? Or where does somebody's experience not fit? You know, the art is understanding where the model works well and where it doesn't. 
and if it doesn't work well, you can actually kind of have a surrogate way of making it do what you think it should do. Mm -hmm. So at that point, you know, your experience then that really becomes the model. I mean, they almost they meld together. So you really have lost that ability to trade, you know, compare one against the other. So you have to be careful of that. You know, mm -hmm. At that point, you actually have only one opinion. You don't have two. You've just seen how Rob Seeley develops a mental picture of a fire from both a broad and a narrow perspective, and how he chooses among many fire behavior prediction models. In your own work on wildland fires, how do you develop your mental picture of a fire and keep one perspective from dominating another perspective? How do you choose one fire prediction model over another? Regardless of which model you choose, how do you merge all your perspectives of a particular fire into the final fire behavior forecast?